is Ms. Kate Hodge, and she will be speaking about a new take on teaching mummification. All right, let me share my screen. All right, can everyone see it? Yes, we can see it just fine. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Okay, perfect. So thank you again for that introduction, as well as for the opportunity to speak here. Um, like she mentioned, my name is Kate Hodge, and I'll be talking about a new way of teaching mummification. And just as a warning, there will be images of mummified individuals on the following slides. Um, so uh, I, like I said, I'm Kate Hodge. I work at the Isaac Museum or the Institute for the Study of Ancient Cultures. We do have a museum and galleries that are dedicated to collections from West Asia and North Africa, but today I'll be specifically talking about uh, the, gal the Egyptian galleries. Um, we currently have three individuals on display. There's Mara Salman, who you can see on the bottom left here from the third intermediate period. Petasiris, who is on the bottom right from the late period or dynasty 26. And then finally, a four-year-old boy whose name, unfortunately, we just don't know. Um, at the museum these days, we are moving towards using the words mummified individual or their names, Marisalman and Petisiris, whenever possible, instead of the word mummy. Uh, my position at the ISAC Museum is that of Youth and Family Program Manager. I actually worked at the ISAC as a student and graduated from the University of Chicago in 2019. Um, as a student, I was a museum educator, so I've spent a great deal of time through the years in the galleries, and I started in this position in February of 2022. Uh, my personal specialization is in informal education and STEM education. I do have a lot of experience in archaeology and have been on excavations before, um, and a big part of my job as as youth and family program manager is content creation. Now, I'm not an Egyptologist, but I do have the enormous benefit and privilege of getting to work with a lot of content experts. Um, so throughout the development of this lesson plan and all of its different iterations, I was lucky enough to work with Diana sorry, Dr. Brian Muse, who's an Egyptologist, um, who was kind enough to review the lesson and provide a lot of feedback. Um, Dasha, Dr. Tasha Vorderstrass, who you'll actually get to hear from next, uh, who not only has a lot of content knowledge, but is also an educator herself. Uh, Katie Witt, who is a PhD candidate in Egyptology at the University of Chicago, who was not only able to review the lesson, but teach it as well so that I could kind of watch it, you know, happen in real life. And then finally, Madeline roberts Ganim, who who was one of my summer interns this past summer, who helped me develop the lesson, kind of put everything together and, uh, you know, work out some of the knots. So when I say educational programs at the ISAC Museum, what I really am referring to are like two hour long field trips that teachers from, you know, around uh, Chicago, as well as other states can request to come to the museum. They're uh, consist of an hour downstairs in our classroom doing more formal type learning, as well as an hour upstairs in our galleries doing more informal type learning. All of these options are inquiry-based, engaging, hands-on, and standards aligned. We do always offer three sort of like standard field trip option options that provide a like broader introduction into archaeology in general. Um, more recently, this past fall, or starting this past fall rather, we've started doing more like niche topics. Mollification is one great example of that. Um, from the graph that you can see here, uh, one thing that I started doing last school year at the very beginning was asking teachers and chaperones to fill out evaluations on our classes. And one of the questions that I asked was what topics they'd be interested in coming back to the museum for to take a new class in. And you can see from this that modification won by quite a lot. So this was kind of the first indication and first uh, motivation I got to even try kind of creating a full long lesson for this. Um, now, before I got into kind of expanding it into this full like two hour long program, I had the opportunity to create a shorter sort of 30 minute uh, lesson that was sort of an idea to like pilot it just to see if it would be possible. So the goal was to create a nice short lesson about mummification to make it as hands on as possible with um, object replicas uh, using best practices, make sure that it's expert reviewed to ensure not only accuracy, but quality as well. And then finally, to teach it multiple times, test it, and kind of collect up evaluations and see how we're doing and if people enjoyed it and got anything out of it. Um, 
So in this, we collected this data and that's where these two graphs are coming from. Uh, we taught this lesson four times uh, to uh, different size classes, which probably ended up being around a little over 100 students and their parents. Uh, I asked them a couple different questions, one of which was what they enjoyed about the lesson. Um, and it turns out that they did enjoy learning more about mummification. I also asked them what specifically they learned about mummification. Again, this was a very simple, very brief piloting thing, just to see if sort of the points of the lesson were coming across. And while I was very glad to see that they got the point that mummification is um, not just in ancient Egypt, but in a lot of different cultures, as well as something um, that can be like a natural process. Uh, we were kind of falling short on this idea of mummification being very important to the religion and culture of ancient Egyptians. So with this piloting experience, we learned a massive amount. Uh, I learned that doing a hands-on lesson uh, without this replica of a mummified individual, as was done many, many years ago, was possible. It was engaging and something that students got a lot out of. Also that a lesson in mummification was something that people wanted from that evaluation, but they actually followed through on taking. Sometimes there's a little bit of like a dissonance between what people say that they want and then what they come to the museum for. So it was really great to see that people actually came and took this lesson in person. And then finally, I knew that for a full lesson, again, going from like just a half hour to sort of an hour downstairs and an hour in our galleries, that I wanted to work on correcting misconceptions, emphasizing uh, the process of mummification changing through time, and then finally really making sure to provide context and emphasize how important Egyptian religion and culture was in this. So um, this is sort of the first part of developing that full lesson. Um, we try to do a conversation about organics and inorganics in most of these field trip opportunities that we teach, just because they're going into the galleries and they're seeing lots of different materials on display. So having that kind of like scientific knowledge we feel provides a really rich experience to understanding the science of archeology span in general. So we started off the same way here where we're talking about inorganics and organics. Uh, then we move into sort of the impact of climate on that. You can see an example of a slide that we use during the class on the right here. Um, and then we use that as a transition to start talking about where mummification is found, why it's found there, and then directly move into uh, Egyptian mummification specifically. So this part of the lesson is what I started calling this like three flag activity. So we take the mummification process step by step and we make sure that the students are engaging with each step of the process, understanding like the religion, preservation, worldview, all of those different components of it. So basically we'll start this part of the activity by first providing a replica that the students can like look at and engage with. Then we'll move into providing a brief description about that part of the step. And then we'll move directly into sort of this like three flag component where students are given uh, three color coded cards, one that says preservation, one that says religion, and finally one that says worldview. And we ask them to hold up whichever card they think or multiple cards they think that step had. So for example, in a real version of the lesson, um, let's say that a museum educator was talking about the part of the process with canopic jars. They'd start off by putting a replica of just the jar, nothing else on the table for the students to look at, you know, sort of like handle and interact with. And then they move into explaining that part of the process. So something as simple to the effect of, uh, an embalmer would make an incision in the individual, remove organs, but leave the heart in the body, and then mummify four specific organs, place them in canopic jars. Those canopic jars were very important, and they'd accompany the deceased individual into their tomb or resting place. And then after that, they would ask the students to hold up the cards that they thought were there. Um, so then at that point, they'd call on different students and be like, okay, cool, I can see that you're holding up preservation explain why, like walk me through it. So this part of the lesson takes a long time just because you're kind of not only directly engaging with a lot of individual students, but giving them time to think and really engage with all the different components. From there, we move on to emphasizing the context of mummification through time. So we're trying to emphasize that it was a process that changed. Um, this part of the lesson actually all came from a comment that Dr. Brian Muse left on one of the lesson plans saying that like, okay, that was good, like good summary. 
But if you ever wanted to expand it, talking about how mummification changed through time would probably be a good idea. I agreed. I thought it was an awesome idea. So this is one section that now that they've heard the mummification process, hopefully they understand it pretty comprehensively. We want to sort of like engage them with this idea that it was not a static process, but rather a dynamic one. So we start this off by describing that the process that they just heard, um, sort of like the classic mummification process that you'd see on the internet is from the New Kingdom. Uh, and then we give them a set of six cards that we ask them to put in order chronologically. Uh, we give them these cards as a group to kind of work together to you know piece things out. Uh, you can see an example of those cards below and then we'll come back together as a class and discuss it. After that, uh, we continue the lesson into the galleries. Most of that tour is spent in the Egyptian gallery of the museum. Uh, the students will see the real artifacts that they interacted with the replicas of downstairs. They'll expand their knowledge and context of ancient Egypt, not just about you know, the mummification process and the different artifacts that are associated with that, but also just about, you know, like. Egypt in general, and then we'll engage them with new terms. Um, so essentially uh, explaining to them and having them do a kind of Socratic method with the word mummy and then moving them away from that and towards using something like mummified individual or their names, Marisalmon and Petisiris instead. Now, um, I cannot emphasize enough how new this lesson is. Um, in Chicago, we start our school a little bit later. Uh, so we taught this for the very first time um, in its full kind of like two hour long period in the middle of September. Since then, we've taught the class four times and collected 13 evaluations. So we're really excited to continue teaching it and adjusting and learning every single time we do it. But this is just the data that we've collected so far. Um, so the first thing that we ask is to have them rate us on a scale of one to five, five being we had an excellent time. So for the class, we're seeing that people are giving us fairly good marks, about 70% are giving us five out of five, the remainder are four out of five. The tour is scoring better at the moment with 85% of them giving us a five out of five, and then the remainder giving us a four out of five. We're also getting really good qualitative feedback from these evaluations. So teachers and chaperones saying that they really enjoyed it. Um, that this is something that they were excited to learn more about and that they were really interested in continuing to talk with their students about religion and culture of ancient Egypt, which was great for us. That means that hopefully we're getting more of that across than we were before. Um, we're also doing a lot of uh, check-ins and feedbacks with the museum education team that are teaching this as well as myself. So I'll go down and teach it or I'll shadow just to like really have the opportunity to watch and observe to see how the kids are reacting, um, you know, different things that come up like that. So we are constantly learning and adjusting as we're going through, which has been a really valuable process. Uh, for example, um, these are two examples of just things that were we've kind of adjusted even in those four lessons that we've taught so far. Uh, at the very beginning, we had this idea that we'd have uh, students work in small groups to do that three flag activity. So they kind of, you know, confer amongst one another and then as a group decide on what they wanted to raise up. Uh, we learned pretty quickly that we thought it would be a really good opportunity to have them work as a group with this like big timeline activity, but that for the mummification process, we really wanted students to sort of confer internally, figure out what they thought was best or what their opinions were and engage with that process really personally and then hold it up. Uh, we also have adjusted the tour so that they're spending more time in the Egyptian galleries and not just in the Egyptian galleries where the mummified individuals are, but also just in the galleries themselves holistically. So again, they're kind of coming away with as well-rounded an experience as we can possibly provide in such a short amount of time. Um, but like I said, we're really excited to continue teaching this, continuing to, to collect data, and then also continuing to just like learn and adjust as we go through. Um, again, a huge thank you to Dr. Brian Muse, who was kind enough to review this, as well as Tasha Vorderstrass, Madeline Robert Scanham, and Katie Witt, all for helping me teach it and just adapt it through time. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, and I'm sure we all have questions. So if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A at the bottom there of your taskbar on Zoom. Um, I guess to start off, so, so which did you find was the most interesting aspect of uh, this activity? Like what, did you find anything that you were surprised about with the interaction with the participants or, or just for yourself? 
Definitely. There honestly have been a lot of parts. Um, so I'll just do the ones that kind of came to mind immediately. Uh, the first one was how sometimes, you know, when you're developing a lesson, you're, I get really nervous about whether or not kids will actually engage with you and participate, uh, especially with the three flag activity. That was something that I kind of came up with randomly. And then the more and more I thought about it, the more I liked it. And the very first time I taught it, you know, we're kind of all waiting there, seeing if the kids would get into it and participate. And they seemed to really enjoy it. And they were actually able to defend their answers and kind of explain their thought processes in a very articulate, impressive way, like more so than I think I can do. Um, so that for me, I think consistently, even when I go down there and kind of check in on my um, museum educator team to see how the lesson is going that day, uh, I've been consistently impressed by but also just it's been a lot of fun to see what they come up with because it's very inventive oh, that's so amazing yeah we have some comments thank you for sharing your amazing techniques uh, we do have a couple questions so the first one here any comments on why the students seem to like the gallery tour even more than the hands-on part yeah that's a great question that i would love an answer to as well i think at the moment um our tours, generally speaking, just thinking off the top of my head from the evaluation data from last year across all of the classes, were a little bit higher than the downstairs portion. The kids know they're coming to a museum. Um, when they first come in the building, the, you know, the doors to the museum are glass, so you can kind of see these very large, very impressive and beautiful artifacts right off the bat, and then they have to be shepherded downstairs. So I think there just may be the, an aspect of the way that the visit is designed where they really want to go and see real stuff, um, and then they have to go downstairs and learn, uh, which they seem to enjoy, but I can kind of understand as well. Um, so that's kind of my best guess at this point. I think it's just also genuinely enjoyable for the kids to be able to see so many different types of artifacts, um, you know, see mummified individuals in person that has had a really big uh, kind of impact on kids the more and more we do it. Um, so I'm not sure which one it is or if either of those things are correct to begin with, but that's that's kind of what I guess. Wonderful. Um, yeah, I can I can get the uh, the sense of being just awed by walking into that museum because I am still thrilled every time I get to visit. Yeah, <laughs> so I do this imagine <laughs> the kids are also excited. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I can definitely identify with that as well. So. Oh, awesome. Okay, we have time for one more question. So we'll take this one from the Q&A. There isn't time to do a full-time Apple mummifying experiment, but if you could have hands-on examples of how Natron preserved fruit um, is the best versus just table salt, baking soda, et cetera, how much detail is provided about the composition of the mummification materials? Oh, that's a good question. Um, right now, our approach is kind of to provide something between like a two and six sentence long description for each part of the process. And we sort of broke down the process into its, you know, six kind of largest parts. Um, so in terms of detail about like the chemical composition of natron or something like that, or uh, anything really specific about linen, um, we don't really go into. We do talk about how we kind of explain that it's something between like salt and baking soda, just so they have, you know, some sort of anchoring point as to what that is. But we don't go into more detail than that. I'm always a fan of the more science, the better. Um, so we might, it might be one of those things that we adjust. Um, but that's a good thought. I hadn't really thought of uh, of changing that up too much, but I like the idea of messing with that. Yeah, yeah, and maybe for even a little older um, age group as well. So really adding the like application of STEM, which I think is lacking from a lot of like, you know, science education. Yeah. You know, actually find out how it's applied and how it can be used um, to get interest. Great, yeah, well, absolutely. thank you so much. I, I, from all the comments, everyone's enjoying your presentation. So thank you so much for that. And we will now turn to the final presenter of 